So, um, Michael, hello. Uh, can you please introduce yourself and and tell us what you do at Heart Scientific? Yeah, so so my name is Michael Hart, um, and I'm the founder and currently the president of Heart Scientific Consulting. Uh, also a faculty member at the University of Arizona College of Optical Sciences. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so can you tell me a little bit more what Heart Scientific does and what kind of markets you actually touch and are involved with? So our corporate capability uh, revolves around making uh, sharp images uh, through you know, turbulent media. So that's a little bit uh, jargony, but uh, imagine, if you will, uh, looking across a hot Arizona parking lot in the middle of July, and uh, you yeah. see the heat shimmer rising off the top. If you try and look through that heat shimmer at whatever it might be on the other side, the fencing or the, the cars or what have you, uh, the, their images waver and wobble and they blur and, and it's a little difficult to, um, to see any detail. Um, and another phenomenon that, that anybody who's ever looked up at the night sky is familiar with right, is that stars twinkle. Um, and it's the same effect. It's uh, turbulence in, in the Earth's atmosphere that, that we look through uh, that, that causes that blurring twinkling effect. If you go up to space, uh, and look at the stars, they're rock steady. Uh, so anytime we're trying to look through uh, the air for whatever reason it might be, if you're an astronomer trying to look at a distant galaxy or a quasar, uh, it would be very nice if you could just make the atmosphere go away. Uh, and that's a little hard to do and it might have some disastrous side effects like we wouldn't be able to breathe um, but fortunately, there are, there are uh, other optical methods that we can use to uh, 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 mitigate the, the degrading effects of the atmosphere on our imaging systems. Um, and to do so, we use the, the techniques of adaptive optics, so-called. Uh, and that is what Heart's Eye is really all about. It's making blurry images sharp again. That was a wonderful explanation of adaptive optics. Markets or techniques, but I can do that if you like to. Yes, please. Yeah. Um, so let me talk up for a moment about how adaptive optics works. Um, the uh, the twinkling of starlight or the heat shimmer effect that we're that we're familiar with is a random dynamic process. It's never the same from literally millisecond to millisecond. Uh, so, in order to uh, apply a correction to the light that's coming into our imaging system, we first of all have to make a measurement. Uh, so, an adaptive optic system of the kind that Heart's Eye builds consists of essentially uh, uh, a, 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 um, a camera, cleverly configured, um, that makes a measurement of in real time of what is going on in the atmosphere. Then the second component after you make the measurement is some computation that happens real fast. And then uh, a, uh, uh, a third component is the actual correction. And we do that by physically bending a mirror. So there's a mirror in the light path, light comes in and bounces off. And we physically deform the shape of that mirror in real time, hundreds or thousands of times a second uh, to uh, correct the aberrations that are introduced into our light beam. Uh, by the atmosphere. So many people are interested in um, fixing the atmospheric blurring effects, if you will. And I got my start in this business as an astronomer uh, at, at the University of Arizona at Stewart Observatory. Um, uh, it was way back centuries ago, Sir Isaac Newton first recognized that there was a, there was a problem uh, in, interposed by the atmosphere in, in the imaging made by his telescopes. And he thought that the only solution was to, was to go to the tops of the highest mountains, uh, uh, avoiding the grosser clouds. 
So we still try to do that as astronomers. We go to high mm -hmm. mountain tops to get above as much atmosphere as possible, and we try like crazy to avoid clouds, gross or otherwise. Um, but nonetheless, uh, you know, he couldn't foresee, uh, great as Sir Isaac was, that, that there would one day be these things called digital computers. Uh, and, and, and the invention and, and now Moore's law, the, the cheap availability of fast computation has made these uh, techniques of adaptive optics possible. So astronomers uh, pioneered uh, the use of adaptive optics for looking upwards at, at things very far away. Um, it was uh, that was in the in the 1950s uh, in uh, in in uh, California. Matt Wilson, uh, mm -hmm. uh, an astronomer by the name of Horace Babcock, who first conceived of and built an adaptive optic system. Um, it wasn't until 20 years later, though, that another another an entirely different community was able to afford the real time computation uh, in the 1970s, and that was the United States Air Force. And they were also interested in looking at things in space, but not so much galaxies and quasars, but the new things that had begun to go up there that were made by humans. Uh, and they had entirely different motivations uh, for looking into, into space. And that community continues uh, uh, to do what it does, uh, looking at, uh, at human-made objects uh, in space. Uh, uh, the astronomers and, and, and the Air Force folk now work uh, closely, in fact, in developing the technologies that we continue to use for our various purposes. Um, there, are, there are other uses for, for uh, adaptive optics. Uh, laser communications now is, a, is an upcoming uh, market mm -hmm. opportunity uh, for companies like ours. Uh, the satellites that are going up into low Earth orbit, uh, both for military and uh, uh, civilian use now, uh, are increasingly going to rely on what are called optical intersatellite links. These are lasers beamed, if, if you imagine, can imagine it, from satellite to satellite, with many times the bandwidth of uh, radio frequency communications that are, that are used now. But at some point, you have to get the data back down to the ground, and you have to be able to talk from the ground back up to the spacecraft. So obviously you don't need adaptive optics in space because there's no atmosphere to correct. But in order to talk to the satellites, uh, both up and down, you have, to get, you have to talk down to the ground again. And there you do indeed have to encounter the atmosphere uh, and adaptive optics comes into its own. Uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in, the, in the business of, uh, of optical satellite communications. Um, there's a whole medical community too that uses adaptive optics uh, for appearing through human tissue, uh, for example. So uh, hmm. histology uh, 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 the, uh, and pathologists will, uh, will use um, microscopes uh, which have adaptive optic systems built into them as well. So there we're not looking through the turbulent atmosphere, but we are trying to peer through uh, layers of, of tissue uh, to see what lies underneath. Uh, so all of those uh, areas uh, in very different uh, applications uh, rely on rapid measurement and correction of uh, aberrations introduced into light as we're trying to make high resolution images. Great, thank you. Um, that was uh, very interesting. I did not know about the medical application of uh, adaptive optics. That is a, a new aspect that I had not thought about. Um, and I'm um, curious, maybe at some point I'll ask you a bit more about that. Um, well, yes. So, um, but let me ask you maybe uh, a next question, and um, I might know the answer to that already, but I'll ask it anyway. So what brought you to Tucson? And it sounds like you are the founder of the uh, company. So um, what brought you to Tucson and the company to Tucson? What um, made you found a company here particularly? So I uh, first came to Tucson uh, in 1986 uh, to work 
at the University of Arizona Mirror Lab uh, for, a, for a summer as an undergraduate student. Uh, and I decided that I, that I loved the Southwest, I loved the Sonoran Desert. Uh, so in my youth and naivety, I applied to the University of Arizona Astronomy Graduate Program, and it was the only program I applied to, and thank goodness they accepted me. Uh, I don't know what would have happened had they not. Maybe I'd be an investment banker or something. Uh, but fortunately, they did accept me. So I came, I came back to Tucson permanently in 1987 uh, to attend graduate school. Uh, and I have remained here ever since. Uh, and it was, uh, I, I was convinced uh, back in, in the day that I wanted to be a cosmologist. I wanted to address the fundamental questions about where we all came from. Where did the universe mm -hmm. begin? Uh, and then right around my second year or so uh, as a PhD student, uh, I took a course on current topics in astronomy, one part of which had to do with adaptive optics. And I was sunk. I switched <laughs> over to the dark side and went from astronomical <laughs> science to instrumentation, and I found it absolutely fascinating that you could uh, you could do this trick of m measuring these uh, the the impacts on light of, uh, of of the atmospheric aberrations and do something about it, and fix them, and uh, improve uh, all sorts of astronomical science thereby. Uh, so I've spent my career uh, on these uh, on these techniques. Um, and then, uh, uh, my goodness, right around uh, the mid 2000s, uh, I began to do a little bit of consulting work on, on the side at the request of some colleagues in the aerospace industry who fooled themselves into thinking I knew something. Um, and uh, uh, so I founded the company in 2008. Uh, here, obviously, we are a Arizona domestic. Uh, limited liability company. Um, and uh, it was me and my spare bedroom yeah. at the time, and that was Heartside. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, in the dozen or so years since then, we've uh, grown substantially. Wonderful. So now uh, now you you gave us a lot of the history of uh, of you and the company and uh, uh, and some of the um, the instrumentation, how it developed over the years and where it was first um, brought to fruition. Now let's look a little bit more into the future and um, and can you tell me what you would see how your company and what your company does? really affects the future, the future being maybe the future of us, mankind. You can get as philosophical as you would like to. <laughs> um, or uh, maybe more specific, the future of Tucson um, or the future of, uh, of just uh, adaptive optics. You can also get more specific. So mm. please. Well, uh... Uh, in 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 sort of pseudo random order, um, <laughs> as the thoughts occur to me, uh, Tucson is the natural home for a company like Heartside. We are a, a very small uh, business with about ten employees at the moment, but as we point out to our customers, large and small, we have very deep reach back into the community that is Optics Valley. Uh, and mm -hmm. we do this routinely. We work with consultants. We collaborate with other small businesses uh, around uh, Tucson and with the university, of course. Uh, and that is one of the things that helps us, as we like to put it, to punch it well above our weight. Uh, we have a lot of people, uh, whom, uh, fellow engineers and, and scientists, whom we can call upon uh, as part of this. Uh, interconnected network that we call Optics Valley. Uh, so it's a very natural place for us uh, to exist. Uh, our customer base uh, at the moment is largely the Department of Defense. Uh, and uh, 
one of the things we specialize in is helping them and their uh, and, and and related uh, their their other their related business partners to understand what their own requirements are. Uh, mm -hmm. Or <laughs> my uh, co-owner and vice president Steve will uh, and I have this running conversation about uh, what Heart's Eye is all about. I never like to build the same thing twice. Uh, so. Uh, but I, I rejoice when a uh, potential customer comes to us and says, I have this problem and I think I have an idea about how to approach it. And we sit down together and we work out what a solution might look like uh, and decide what the requirements are and how it will work. Uh, and, uh, and then we go away, design and build and then deploy and commission uh, a one-off system that works really well and, uh, and, and, and causes happiness. Uh, uh, in our in our customer. Um, that said, uh, a, a business only grows so far if you're building one-offs. Uh, and so Steve has a has a an excellent point to make when he says that uh, we need to be in the business of making uh, multiple copies, uh, <laughs> consumer products, if you will. Uh, and so, in fact, we have just fairly recently embarked on our our very first internal research and development program uh, to build a product that we can indeed commercialize uh, and sell uh, to the world uh, uh, for uh, a, a, an adaptive optic system that is designed for a telescope of modest size in the one meter range or so. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're partnering with uh, uh, other businesses who, whose, whose job it is to make such telescopes. Uh, and uh, putting those out into the community. Uh, and those will serve uh, a varied community uh, from the aforementioned uh, 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 satellite operators who want to be able to communicate with, uh, with their birds uh, optically. Mm -hmm. uh, we, uh, we also see a market, uh, a fairly restricted, but nonetheless uh, well worthwhile market, uh, uh, people who who are fortunate enough to be able to go out and buy their own one meter class telescope. And there are those who are passionate about astronomy and take their astrophotography seriously. Wow. And like to uh, uh, benefit from uh, the clearer visions of the heavens that, uh, that uh, adaptive optic systems can afford them. Um, uh, and and there's the uh, uh, defense community as well, which is increasingly concerned about the proliferation of uh, satellites, uh, in particularly in low Earth orbit. Um, I don't think we're yet in any great danger of encountering the so-called Kessler syndrome. Um, for those who've seen the movie Gravity, uh, which starts out with uh, an astronaut trying to fix a space telescope, uh, which is promptly impacted by a, a whirling particle of debris traveling at 17,000 miles an hour, um, uh, disintegrating everything in, in its path. Uh, the Kessler syndrome uh, is, uh, is a warning to us if we uh, pollute the space environment. It's essentially a runaway uh, reaction whereby one piece of debris collides with a satellite, creating thousands of more pieces of debris, which go on then to destroy everything uh, uh, that we have put up there and rendering uh, those uh, orbits unusable. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, a, that's a, a, a situation greatly to be uh, avoided. Um, and the first, uh, sort of in the sense of you can't correct what you haven't first measured, uh, a, a, a a philosophy that Olivia will be familiar with because uh, I impress that upon all my students. Uh, you can't do something about a situation that you don't first know about. And so the first uh, uh, challenge in, uh, in dealing with overcrowding in, in uh, low Earth uh, orbits in space is knowing what's there. Uh, and that leads to a field called space situational awareness, uh, which uh, uh, the U.S. Air Force and now the U.S. Space Force uh, is in charge of managing. And that means mm -hmm. looking, literally looking up into space and cataloging everything that's there. 
uh, and adaptive optics can is of great value in in that mission as well yeah because you can probably keep track of much smaller pieces that way you can yeah yep i think also uh it's interesting that you mentioned about um people wanting to up their astrophotography game or even people buying them themselves a one meter telescope i mean for those who are not in optics you know that may might not mean anything but like a one meter telescope is you know it's pretty mm. big and, and not everyone has one of those but being able to add that technology to you know yes. your telescope at home or you know your uh your astrophotography would be uh definitely people would be interested in that that's kind of cool here we we do hope so yes <laughs> we'll gladly uh, so if that market in the interests of, uh, of, of beautiful photographs of, uh, of the heavens. Wonderful. So one, one last question is, um, do you want to tell us anything about um, the company or Tucson, uh, the concluding remark um, that you haven't told us yet? Oh, my. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, so HeartSci as a company is is delighted to be a part of and, and looking forward to continuing to contribute to the growth of uh, Tucson, uh, uh, to the growth of Optics Valley uh, more broadly. Um, it was the clear skies of, uh, of Southern Arizona that uh, enabled the foundation of the astronomy department at the University of Arizona, which has then which then evolved into the College of Optical Sciences uh, at the U of A, uh, and that in turn led to the growth of the optics industry here. Uh, so we have uh, a century and more of, of growth uh, behind us, uh, and uh, in the nature of things exponential, uh, I look forward to seeing more of, of uh, more of the same kind of growth uh, over the next century, although I won't be around for much more of it to see. <laughs> Wonderful. You'll Thank be you. around for a while, Michael. Yeah. <laughs> I hope so. You're young. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, right. Tell that to the gray. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Wonderful.